guys so much. Tonight, as we continue our To Tell the Truth, um, I'm going to talk tonight about the truth about compromise. Compromise is a great word, and it's a lot of things need compromise. If you are married, um, when you deal with your spouse, there's a lot of times you need to compromise about things, right? I mean, there, 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 there's no doubt you should have to compromise about certain situations, certain things in your family, um, certain decisions. There's, it, it, it's a good thing for a couple to learn. Sometimes, um, you know, compromise is a good thing to do in business. And, and, and in things in life that are non-essential, compromise is great. I think even when it comes to church, compromise is great in non-essential things. What do I mean about non-essential things? Non-essential things are the colors of the wall, the colors of the carpet, the, um, the, the, the colors of furniture and things like that. Those are non-essentials. You can compromise about that. What types of things do we not want to compromise about? We don't want to compromise on doctrinal things or truths. We don't want to compromise on, on, on our Christian faith and what it takes to meet Jesus. And, and so we are in an age where that's what truth is fought about. Well, you, gotta, you should compromise. Um, a, a Christians ought to compromise in their faith so that they can get along with other religions. Let me tell you a story. This is a true story. Back in, in 2001... Most of you know in September 2001 what happened. We know the terrible events of 9-11 that took place and when, when um, you know, the, the, the Twin Towers were hit, the Pentagon was hit, the plane um, that crashed in Pennsylvania and, and all those terrorist acts that cost uh, around 3,000 people to die and then set us into war. Well, our general overseer at the time was Dr. Lamar Vest. And Dr. Lamar Vest... Um, was asked to represent the Church of God at a prayer meeting at Ground Zero. And, um, and so they called the head offices in Cleveland, Tennessee. Now, this is not secondhand. Dr. Vest told me this in 2002, um, as I had the privilege of, of picking him up and carrying him to a um, prayer conference that year in January of 2002. Um, Dr. Vest shared with me this, and he was not bragging or anything. And they called and said, Dr. Vest, would you come and be one of the people who pray at this event? And he said, he said, well, he said, I would love to. They said, but now here's one thing you can't do when you pray. Because this is a multi-religious event. You can't pray in Jesus' name. And so Dr. Vess didn't think about it. He said, right then, he said, the church of God will not be represented at this event. And so then they interviewed him on um, Good Morning America and asked him, why does the church of God not want to do this? He said, look, he said, it's a fundamental part of our faith. That when we pray, we pray in Jesus' name. And that, 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 that we call in, in Jesus' name when we pray. And if I can't pray in Jesus' name, yeah, I can't pray. And so, um, you know, sometimes that was, what was that? That was a truth about compromise right there. Um, there were a lot of good, wonderful Christians who perhaps compromised to do that. But they did this so that they could put Christians with Muslims and Christians, with Hindus and, 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 and other different religious sects. We respect the fact that they have freedom of religion to practice their faith, but we still know that the truth is there is but one truth, and that's Jesus Christ. And so that's what th th this is about. Again, I'll take you back to Matthew 24, and this is our main scripture for all these that we're going to go over Matthew 24, verse 4, it says, Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceive you. That's why we have to have truth. Revelations chapter 2. I'm going to take, we spent a lot of time at the beginning of the year in Revelations chapter 2. But when I thought about truth about compromise, this hit me here. This is a powerful part here. And I'm going to read verses 18 to 29. So 
Just pardon me as we, as Mike keeps up here. In verse 18, it says, And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into a great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now to you I say, and the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power to, over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed into pieces like the potter's vessels, as I also have received from my father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Back a few months ago, we talked about Thyatira. But I want to share with you some different things about Thyatira represents the church from 606 to 1500 A.D. During this age, the church at Rome gained prominence and began to propagate many false teachings and doctrines. What they do, the church at Rome denied the finished work of Jesus Christ. They mixed works with faith. And during this age, many practices became prominent, such as kissing the Pope's foot, worshiping images and relics, the use of holy water, prayer beads, canonization of dead saints, celibacy of the priesthood, mass, confession, rosary, and worship of Mary. I'm not here to bash the Catholic Church. That's not what I'm here to do. But it's those particular things and those particular things as taught are heretical things. Uh, folks, you don't have to go and kiss the feet of the person who's leading you into the presence of God. Um, in fact, you don't want to kiss my feet, I promise you. All right? You don't, you don't have to, or you should not, we, we don't have to worship images. And, 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 and listen, we all love the images that are created, images of, of Christ that we see. Most pictures that we see of Christ came from Italian artists who made him look like, um, uh, made him look like he was, he was an Italian thoroughbred. And, um, and the fact of the matter is, Jesus wasn't Italian. And when you see those pictures of him, and, and they beautify Jesus on the cross, when there's nothing beautiful about it. In fact, it's one of the most horrendous things ever to take place. We thank God that he did that for us, but there's nothing beautiful about the cross. There's something sacred about the cross. But we don't bow down. If we see a picture of Jesus, we don't bow down to that picture, do we? We bow down to Jesus himself. Several, uh, a couple of years ago, I had somebody call me, and um, they, they found a Bible that somebody had thrown in the trash can, and, and I, I love the Word of God, and it was a Bible that was tattered, and paper and pages were ripped out of it, and the person called me and asked if I could, they said they took it out of the trash can, they wrapped it up, put it in aluminum foil, and asked if I could pray over the Bible, I said, why would I have to pray over that book? I said, the book itself will eventually tear up. It's the word that stays around. And I said, there, I said, I said, just because somebody happened to throw away an old Bible, there's nothing sacrilegious about it, folks. You know, if they were throwing it away to be sacrilegious, then that's a different story. But there's nothing we can do about that. And we don't have to pray over the Bible because the word of God is already anointed. And I told that person, I said, look, if you want to do something like that, that's fine. I said, but we don't have any ritual to get rid of Bibles at the church. There's no rituals we have. We don't have a special Bible. Uh, I had to tell this person, I said, we don't have a special Bible capsule to drop it in to, 
get rid of, um, you know, because we don't recycle them or anything. And, and so, um, you know, those are things that we don't have to worship those things. I don't worship this Bible. I worship the writer of it. I worship the one who gave us the word. And I, and I love the word. Um, and I use different Bibles. In fact, this is my Bible I keep up here. The reason I keep this one up here is if I have to go through something very quick. But I have my notes on my on my, on, on my tablet, so I very rarely have to even open this. I have this up here because Brother Eddie is the only leather one I got. And I like to smell the leather Bible every now and again. You know, every preacher has to have one. Um, I read my Bible in the morning on my phone, folks. I do my Bible study on my phone. I know that sounds modern, but I can make it as big as I want it on my phone or on my tablet. And so, but you know what? It's the same word in that as I, as I have in this. And so we don't worship those images. The celibacy of the priesthood is perhaps one of the worst things ever to happen in Christendom. Probably caused some of the worst sin to take place, the abuse of children and other people because of this that is not doctrinal and not biblical. Um, and, and so all these things. Now, again, we're not bashing this, but I'm telling you that there's truth and there's compromise. And when we look at the Thyatira church, and this is where we get to, this is where I begin to parallel what we see today and why I'm teaching on to tell the truth. Thyatira was the compromising church. Now, the Thyatira church had a lot of great things. I mean, if you look at the history of the Thyatira church, they had great works. They did a lot of great things. They had, a, they had great love. They were unequaled in their love. Their service, they were out doing wonderful things. They had faith. And you know, a church can build its ministry around works and love and service and faith. And those are all wonderful things. But works, love, service, and faith, those things are not in and of itself bigger than what we need in salvation in Jesus Christ. We have to have works. Uh, we, we, we must have works to get things done. But the reality is, we're not, we, 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 our works are not going to get us to Christ. Our works are a product of our relationship to Christ as we serve Him. There's great service things that we can do. But we have to be careful that we don't take service even to the community and put it above the call of the church. Because the truth is, and I want to tell you this, look, I, I, I have arguments with, with some younger Christians or even younger preachers. And it is not the church's responsibility to solve every social ill in our society. It is the, it is the church's responsibility to, to teach the people of God to go into the world and to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. I believe this, that if people get saved, that fixes social issues. That fixes those things. And so they gave the appearance of thriving, growing, and exciting. That's what we see that a lot. And then people who came and they came by that thyatire church, church, that thyatire church they bragged on them. And, and inflated their ego, ecclesiastical ego by telling them they were the best thing going. Then they got a letter from Jesus that said, These things, says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire. Now that phrase, eyes like a flame of fire, is also seen in Revelation 1.14 where John was describing his vision of Christ. It speaks of the revealing Christ. He sees all and nothing is hidden from him. And I believe he looks at the American church right now and he says, what a compromising church it has become. You see, we have become a people of compromise. And that's where we get to this where he uses Jezebel. Now, in that church, there was a person who had that Jezebel spirit. But I'm going to use, when I'm talking about truth and compromise, and the truth about compromise is Jezebel as part of what we see in the modern Christian movement. Jezebel was a woman of compromise. How do we know that? When she married Ahab, what did she do? She brought her idols with her into the, into the king's castle the king of Israel. She wasn't interested in abolishing the worship of Jehovah. She was fine with having Jehovah worship and idol worship together. 
She, what she wanted was equal time for bail. Doesn't that sound familiar? Well, you know, we can in the public schools today, many of them can, they're glad to teach the fundamentals of Islam and scared to teach the fundamentals of Christianity. Still, still more than twice as many Christians as there are Muslims in this world today. We still have the only way. She wanted the acceptance of those prophets of Baal. She wanted to alter the worship of God and, and felt she could improve on the teaching of the word. And, I mean, and that, that's what she wanted. That's what we see. The spirit of compromise and domination had gripped that Thyatira church and gripped someone in Thyatira. And, and that's what we see today. We see to, in, in a world today where, 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 where we have two doctrines being published, the doctrine of the world and the doctrine of the church. So let's take the doctrine of the world and let's put them together with the church. And you can't do that. And you say, well, the church, the world doesn't have a doctrine. Yes, don't you make any mistake. The world has a doctrine. Because the world in and of itself has become a religion in and of itself because the world wants you to worship the world. It wants you to do that. New Age beliefs, humanism, had infiltrated the worship back then. And what has infiltrated the worship today? I mean, we accept today all kinds of stuff that we wouldn't tolerate 20 years ago, right? Can you think of the things we tolerate today that we and, and maybe I, I may have to maybe date myself, maybe, Brother Kenny, maybe more like 40 years ago that, that we wouldn't accept it. Um, tolerance is the greatest obstacle of truth. Compromise and tolerance. Jesus opened the doors of the kingdom to God, to everyone. Satan claims that there's hidden secrets. Jesus said, I've got this open to whosoever will. Even a little child can understand the truth of the gospel. And what's so sad is, is we've diluted that gospel so much so. That's why we have the eyes like a flame from Jesus. Because Jesus sees what no one else sees. His piercing eyes glazed upon the thigh tire church and saw something that no one else could identify. He says, I have a few things against you. It's not all well, and there's a real problem. What was the problem? The problem in Thyatira was tolerance. And this brings me, I believe, to what I want to get to about the truth about tolerance and compromise today. Look at Revelations 20, verse 20, or Revelations 2, verse 20, excuse me. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and to eat things sacrificed to idols. No one expected this. It was a day of tolerance. They didn't expect this to happen. And this kind of happened in the church world in 2022. What happens is there is a ten to accentuate the positive. And I believe Kelly in being a positive person. I am a positive person. But sometimes we want to accentuate the positive and say, you know what? Everything's all right. And it doesn't matter how you live. And that's just not true. There is, you know, you know one of the things that, that I believe in, and, and, and I try to express to people, there is a beauty to narrow-mindedness when it comes to our faith. Not in the sense that we can't learn more, but because what I'm talking about is I have to be narrow-minded when somebody comes to me and says, well, you know what? It doesn't matter what you believe. I had a guy one time that I pastored him. He wasn't here, so I want you to try to figure out who it was. Um, I pastored this young man, and, and, um, and he left. He and his wife left the church to go to something that because and it, the, the doctor, the, the pastor at this particular church, I'm not going to lie to you, he was deceiving people. He had prophets coming in, calling people to come to that church and leave other churches, so-called prophets coming in and doing that. And, 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 and they had a lot of talent there. But their doctrine was a doctrine that was very dangerous doctrine. And, um, and, but I mean, he, he, he brought in this so-called prophet and the prophet was calling all these people and this one guy, he'd come in my office and 
And he said, well, we think we're going to go there. And I said, look, do you know what they believe? And this is what the young man told me. The young man told me, he said, he said, well, he said, I really don't care what they believe. He said, I don't care what they believe. He said, I just want to feel good. And listen, folks, that is for the entertainment value. Anybody can entertain and, 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 and cause your heartstrings to do something. And so, I, and, I, and I believe in looking for the positive in people, but, but there are some times where we have to tell the truth and, and, and say, look, not everything in this world that's going on is right. And the church has to make a stand. You know, um, and that's what they did at Thyatira. They insinuated the positive and they said, that, you know, there's nothing negative going on. Let's just, anybody, do whatever you want to do, so to speak. Don't even mention it. Let's not talk about sin. Let's not talk about the fact that there's sexual immorality going on. And folks, if there's sexual immorality going on, the church should address it. That was the problem. That was the problem. You know what, though, Jesus... Jesus had a point to be kind of like the prophet Nathan who pointed at him and basically said, you are the man. So what is, what is Jezebel offering? What do we tolerate today over truth? There are various thoughts today about Jezebel's identity, who that person was in the church. But that doesn't matter so much as this. If I were to compare that to today, here's what I would say that is allowed to take place in our society that 40 years ago wasn't. The godlessness. You see, when, when, when we start talking about righteousness, which is the opposite of godlessness, what happens when people of God openly talk about righteousness? What do they say you are? What are they going to say that you are? They're going to say you're intolerant? You're judgmental? They're, they're going to say they're going to say you're intolerant and you're judgmental and you don't you don't have you you, you, don't, you don't have these things you, you don't have a right to call us out we don't have a right to look at what's going on in Hollywood and, and look what's going on in the media and say oh that's wrong that's ungodly and there's godlessness out there go ahead and turn on your favorite TV show today and and, and start watching it and see if they don't put Intentionally, a godless character in a new show. They have it, it bothers me because y'all know I'm that nerd that likes superheroes. Okay, I like superheroes and, and I love superhero shows. And, and 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 it bothers me the fact that they take things that were innocent from child from children's comics, and now in every one of those TV shows, they've got to now put. A homosexual character as if it's normal or a bisexual character or a transgender character because they want to please it you know some of the some some shows that have been famously popular because of uh, of things over the years now they've got to openly do this thing and put godlessness there and and if we say something about it because they have their agenda then our agenda must be messed up and folks it's time that the church realized there is a truth about these things and we cannot tolerate the godlessness action. Now, I don't expect the world to act like me, but I sure don't have to approve of it. You know, when, when my mama, she was really good about making you feel guilty. I don't know if any of you ever had a mama that could do this or any of you ladies, if you could do this. But... When, 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 when I was a young guy, I, I, I'm glad I really, I'm glad I don't live with her anymore. Um, but when I was young and I would get out of sorts or out of, and, and do the wrong thing, my mama had this ability to do something that maybe some of you mamas know how to do. I don't know if all of you do. Um, my mama had looked. I, I mean, anybody know what the look is? My mom had the look. And I knew. When I had done or said something wrong, but mom didn't have to say anything. Most of the time, she didn't have to slap me. I'm not saying she didn't. I'm not saying she did. But my mom, if I had done or said something godless or ungodly, she looked at me. Well, dad did it or my brothers did it or whatever. She looked at me. Man, it would be like melting frost in the snowland. Right there, I mean, I'd melt right, 
And you know how the Bible in, 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 um, in Psalms 97 says the hills melt like wax in the presence of the Lord. Well, I would melt like wax in the presence of my mom because of her staring right through me. And, and so you know, we are going to have to develop that kind of thing. When, when godlessness happens around us, we don't have to be tolerant of it. We can tolerate the people without tolerating the actions. And there's a difference. It doesn't make us judgmental. We, the, the tolerance, we tolerate more violent acts now than we ever had. And, the, and say, you know what, it's okay. It's okay to be violent. And two years ago, they absolutely did some of the most horrendous violent things in this country to so-called to, to so stop other violence. You don't stop violence with violence, do you? You don't burn down cities and, 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 and things like that to try to stop other violence. Is there police brutality? Yes. But just because one policeman does it doesn't mean all of them do it. And I will say this, just because one policeman does it in a certain town in the Midwest or in the South or in the Northeast doesn't mean it's a national problem. It means it's a city problem for that city. Yeah, you understand? I'm, I'm sorry. I probably shouldn't say these things, even if it is true. But we live, the Bible also declares to us in these last days, it's going to be a very violent time. But we don't have to tolerate violence. We shouldn't have to tolerate violence um, when it happens to children or anybody else. Look, we should never tolerate racism. The tolerance of racism is a horrible thing. And, 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 and you know, but you don't tolerate racism or you, or you don't combat racism with racism either, do you? No. It, you, we have to learn not to tolerate those things. These things are byproducts of godlessness. Idolatry. He said, oh, well, we don't see people out worshiping idols, folks. Don't you dare believe it. Well, I probably ought not go there, but I'm going to anyway. Man, this past Saturday, the largest church in North America was Saturday evening in Fayetteville, Arkansas. 80,000 people. 80,000 people. I don't have any problem with Garth Brooks. I don't have any problem with him. I, I mean, I got friends in low places too, Mike. And Mike's my friend, right? But there were more people lifting their hands there than in any church in America. Oh, oh, oh. I'm not just going to leave it at Garth Brooks. The largest church in the Mid-South is no longer Bellevue. The largest church in the Mid-South is now Southland Casino. Drive by. And unfortunately, they have more cars there than in any church in the Mid-South at any given time. That's what I don't, idols? Absolutely. We have idols. We have idols. And I'm going to, I, Michael, I'm a Razorback fan as, as almost as big as one as you are. But you know what? As much as I enjoy the Razorbacks and, and Connie, I, looking at that, you saw that candy apple red truck I showed you yesterday had the Razorback license plate on. But as much as I love that, they can't be my God. They can't be my God. Certainly, if I was going to pick one to be my God, I'd have to be the uh, one with the championship. But, but no, they can't be my God. We can't have idols, but we have more idols now than have ever existed in the history of the world. We just don't call them that. We don't call them that. One of the things that we have accepted as truth today is we've turned the government into God. Do you ever think the government would be making every decision for you? And it is. It's funny, George Orwell, when he wrote the book 1984, and how, how, how true that that has become, 
I absolutely have no doubt that they monitor my calls. So I always, when I'm on, when I'm on my phone, I say, Lord, I pray the ABC's over Joe Biden. Um, government gods. We think now that the government's going to solve our problems financially and morally and socially. And the government has never been able to do that. But you know, the problem with that for us as Americans is the government's not supposed to be our God. We're supposed to be the government. You do know that the government's not based out of Washington, D.C. It's based in the hearts and minds of the people is what it's supposed to be. Because it's of the people, by the people, and for the people, or that's what it's supposed to be. We have now, in our society, we make normal Sodom and Gomorrah lifestyle. Do we not? Sodom and Gomorrah's lifestyle. Greed of our society has become horrible. Greed's always existed. The LGBTQ, what, whatever, 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 whatever. I don't have enough pluses to put all the other letters that they've added to it. I think absolutely we should always show love and compassion to any person. But we cannot legitimize godlessness. There's a truth about this thing. Corruption. The corruption, not just government corruption, but there's corruption all around us. That's the truth. And those are the things that we have tolerated and that we've allowed to infiltrate the church and the kingdom. Why? I want to say that Jezebel represents the church. You see, it's not that America or the world has allowed for compromise. That part's lost. It's that the church has allowed for compromise. We've become the woman of compromise. And what we have to do is take it back. And we have to, it's time that we, that we understand that God has called the church to a greater singular calling. And our calling is to, is to, by the grace of Jesus Christ, to spread that gospel that wipes the slate clean for people's lives to change them. That so somebody that's an LGBTQ can come out of that lifestyle after they're saved. I don't know if I'll get this right exactly. Brother Decanter's grandson, most of you, many of you knew him. Michael, the one that he was a missionary. Michael is now in charge of Chi Alpha, which is the Assembly of God group that goes on the campuses of colleges. Um, you know, we love Chi Alpha. It's a great group. My daughter um, got heavily involved in Chi Alpha at ASU. It was a beautiful group. But he, I believe he's at UCA. He was at a campus. A young lady who was homosexual gave her heart to the Lord in one of their meetings. Got saved. She began to testify. She began to testify to others how God saved her. She came out of that lifestyle. And as she began to testify about these things, they shut down their Chi Alpha groups. As you can no longer meet on campus because somebody's life got changed. No, but as much as they wanted to shut them down, they got enough donations to build their own building, and they've got over 500 college students that go to their Chi Alpha group now. <laughs> See, the devil can try to shut things out, but when you make a stand, and the truth, you see, the, the truth is that God loved that little girl who was a homosexual, but when she gave her heart to the Lord, she came out of that because she was purified because she was saved. And that's what God can do. The world doesn't understand that. They'll never understand that. Understand that. You know, how does, how does Jezebel get a hold of the church? It goes back to Ephesus. The church lost its first love. We've got to get it back. But here's what I believe. I think that we have to go ahead and be honest. Truth and honesty go hand in hand. And, and while we can be full of agape love, 
We still can't be afraid to hurt the feelings of those who are in sin. And, 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 and let me be honest with you. When we tell people to do what's right and to live the right way, it's going to hurt. How many of you did you ever have your parent have to discipline you? Did any of your parents ever have to discipline you? Did your parent ever tell you that it's going to hurt me worse than it hurts you? You didn't believe it. But I'm going to be perfectly honest. When my dad had to ground me because my friend Mark, Jeff, and another friend of ours had went to Memphis and stayed out to 1 o'clock in the morning to, at the age of 16 years old. And when I got back home, my dad lectured me until 6 o'clock in the morning and said, Sue, yet you're going to church. I remember this. My dad told me, he said, you young boys have no business being in that town by yourself in an old 74 Nova. And he was absolutely right. We were in danger. We were just too dumb to know it. And my dad grounded me. The only time I ever got grounded, and my dad grounded me for the next month, and I couldn't, I couldn't go anywhere but to church or to school. But you know what? I learned something. My dad made a statement to me that night that I, it, it, I can't get it out of my head. He said, nothing good happens after midnight. And he was right. And it hurt that I couldn't go out for a month, that I, you know, I didn't have those privileges for a month, but I never did that again. Sometimes, you know, we've had to do that with our own kids and our family, right? It hurt really bad when we took the keys away from my dad that he couldn't drive anymore. In fact, he got so mad at us, he called us everything that he could with his Alzheimer's. But you know why? We, there's a lot of people who won't hurt their parents' feelings when they become a danger to somebody and then they end up killing someone. And we were not about to let dad take off and get lost or, or run over somebody else and kill them. And we had to take that. It, it, it hurt his feelings. It hurt us. I wept. We all wept. But it was for the best. And there's sometimes we have to do that spiritually with people. There are times when you have somebody that if they're involved in something ungodly, even in the church, and it happens, we have to talk to them about it. We may not have to bring them up and make a public spectacle. Sometimes it has to happen. Those are things that are important. We have to embrace God's truth. And here's why. Because the church has to stand up in order to stand out. We've got to stand up and stand out. But you know what Jesus did? Jesus always does this. If you'll remember this last statement, remember nothing else. That's fine. Jesus gave her room to repent. He gave this Jezebel in that church room to repent. Now the Jezebel in the Old Testament, she didn't repent. But he gave this Jezebel room to repent. You know what? We have to remember, here's the truth about compromise. We've got to give the church in 2022 room to repent. If the kingdom of God, the people of God will repent about the compromise to the world, we can walk in truth again. I'm not, said, Pastor, are, are, are you being, I'm not beating up on, I'm talking about the church overall in our society. I believe you guys believe those things. Uh, but you know what? If you were practicing something ungodly, it would be my responsibility, the church's responsibility to, to help you. Because what did Jesus tell us? He says, it's better for us to lose an eye or a hand or, 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 or a finger or an ear and lose that part so that the whole body can enter heaven, right? It's better to cast off that thing that we don't need so that the body can enter heaven. And that's what we've got to do. So, I want us to pray. I want us to pray that God will use us 
as vessels of truth. Not truth in judging, but truth in letting people know. I believe people can take it if we do it in love. I believe people can take it if we will do it. But there, there'll be people that get mad. And there'll be people that call you bigots. There'll be people who will who will say, how dare you say that my child can't do this or that because I want them to be accepted for no matter how they live their lifestyle. The reality is God has set in order how people should live, hasn't he? I mean, he sets it from creation of each person, how they should live. It's up to us to make sure that truth gets taught. God, I pray in the name of Jesus. God, that we will walk in your truth and share that, dear God. Lord, in a godless time, 